Yeah, and, and it's interesting. In her testimony uh, on Friday, uh, she actually had positive things to say about Doug as well. Uh, they were asking her, you know, what, what was your relationship like with him? And it went from, you know, very scary and horrific to I loved him very much. Uh, he made me feel really good about myself. And, and it wasn't all negative. Uh, her, in fact, admitting that she feels horrible about what took place. But at the time, also not feeling like she had any other options, which is where we get to the battered spouse syndrome. It doesn't necessarily mean you're just battered and you're going to go shoot somebody. It means everything uh, is going to be the volume on that relationship is going to be 10 times louder than maybe what it would be if you've not had those traumatic experiences with that spouse that has been battering you. It doesn't always have to be physical either. Emotional is a huge uh, piece of this. And it does sound like Doug in the past has a tendency to kind of fly off the hook uh, from evidence that's not even from Ashley herself, from the ex-wife. Um, that's, that's, that's where it's kind of getting to me. And I'm starting to really wonder what the jurors are going to think about all this, uh, when it comes to, uh, time for them to deliberate. Well, I agree. And I also think, you know, from the autopsy information that we have, right, we know that actually it wasn't in the back, mm -hmm. right? It was an arm grazed to the chest and a leg wound. And then two stray bullets that went into the wall. I remember hearing at least at one point uh, that they were to the back. And I don't think that's been proven as accurate. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you, you're right. The the scratches that were on her side, they did bring that up in the testimony today. And I got to say, I called it. <laughs> I said, it looks like it's from a box. <laughs> it was from a box. But it wasn't her just walking through a crowded room of boxes as she's packing up her things. Uh, she says that Doug was being very aggressive that night where he was where he was shot uh, and had like lifted a box up at her. This is her, her he said, she said thing uh, and lifted it up at her. And then that's what scratched her. But it was, in fact, a box. I called the scratch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, there, there wasn't uh, threats to anyone's life that night uh, until it. it, it you know, until she drew the gun, basically. Uh, he apparently got very upset. And here's the reasoning for, I guess, things getting upset, uh, was she was in the U-Haul or the moving vehicle and saw that both of their things had been mixed together, which in his mind at that point in time was just fine. They're, they're moving together at the same time. Why would, why would it be separated? And according to her, he got quite upset. And started berating her, started saying, you know, it's your stuff, my stuff, same thing. We're married. You need to start acting like a wife. That's a direct quote from what she said in her testimony. Uh, and it just continued on throughout the evening of Doug allegedly being very frustrated with her, her continuing to to try and, and, and de-escalate. According to her, she said she was trying to de-escalate. Uh, and then eventually it, it ended up with the, with the gun being drawn when she felt that she was trapped in the home, according to her. He got in front of the door and said, where are you? Where do you think you're going? Uh, you're, you're not going to leave. And I can stay here the night if I want to after she claims that she asked him to leave. Well, I will say that no matter the he said, she said, when you think about literally somebody getting a gun and this wasn't just your normal, you know, a small 22 or even a nine, this is a huge caliber gun, a 45 uh, caliber gun, which, you know, is difficult to shoot for, for many ladies. Mm -hmm. And it's got a powerful, powerful kick. And she shot, I believe, four times. And just the fact that she went and retrieved that, I just all to say there's some, um, you know, imaginations that had to take place in terms of physical things she had to do during this confrontation to all of a sudden have this gun and shoot him four times. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to those particular details. I didn't hear that yet. It's probably going on as we're recording right now. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be interesting for her to explain that because people don't just walk around with a 45 at their side. No, she claims she retrieved it from the bedroom uh, in a moment where she was trying to, to calm down and, and get away from him that evening. And she had no other recourse. He had been blocking the door, according to her, uh, and... Uh, wanted to find some sort of weapon to maybe make him stand down. 
Uh, and that clearly did not happen. She claims that he got into, as we heard earlier from the uh, attorney, uh, into a like a fighting stance of some sort uh, and allegedly approached her, and that's when she fired uh, the shots. Uh, again, it's a lot of she said. Uh, we don't really know what he'd say. He is gone. So we're strictly relying on that uh, as the evidence, which, again, if you take it at face value, um, and we didn't have the other negative things about Doug, um, it, it is somewhat believable, um, despite there being other inconsistencies in her story. Uh, to me, it almost feels like this is a story of two very unhealthy people that were together engaging in very unhealthy behavior that ended up in a, a horrible uh, horrible situation yeah no i agree but i i still don't think that that story that she's putting forth really holds a lot of water mm -hmm. uh you know i went to go you know collect myself and instead i collected a 45 and came out and true <laughs> he approached me who who approaches a woman that's angry with a, a 45 <laughs> i think i'd be taking cover or running um but in any event, yeah. uh, you know, the story, I agree with you, has taken a turn in her favor, I think, with these prior text messages and the fact they've been able really to paint a bad picture mm -hmm. of of him. And, and uh, because they really only have to reach one juror, mm -hmm. um, you know, it. I think that the scales are tipping a little bit toward the defense, possibly a hung jury. Um, but again, you know, it's when you're really in that courtroom and you get to watch her expressions every day and every minute, you never know, uh, what this jury is really thinking. If she's acting, she's a very good actress. Um, what I believe is that she believes what she's saying. Uh, not to say that that is through the prism of reality, but I do believe she believes what happened was justified and that she had no choice in the matter even though reality may be different um i i don't feel like she's looking at this as i'm trying to spin a tail and get away with something i think she fully believes that everything that took place uh that she had no other no other recourse well and we're seeing other you know uh women get off uh for um you know their actions resulting in the death of their spouse or their loved one mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's certainly a defense that has been working if the jury believes that person testifying. Mm -hmm. And she is uh, doing a good job, I think, from the standpoint of they were very smart uh, to put these messages on from the deceased spouse because it corroborates some of her accusations. It does. And context is important, I think, in fully understanding the character of of who Doug was behind closed doors. And we're getting to see a, a, a couple glimpses of it. And it's not a very pretty picture. And it's not necessarily what I think a lot of the family believes or knew as Doug, because quite often when people are like this, the only people who see it are the, the significant other behind the closed doors. The family's not going to see it. Um, same with her though, too. I, I believe that, uh, you know, there, she was probably a very different person behind closed doors as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the jury thinks uh, at the end of all of this. But but to your point there, you know, uh, dead men tell no lies and no truths, right? True. We only get to see one side of the pancake, and that's why it's very disappointing. I think the the my biggest takeaway so far in this trial is where is the digital evidence, mm -hmm. one way or the other. In other words, it, if they subpoenaed it or got warrants for it. It's either favorable for the defense or favorable for the prosecution, but it just seems not to be there, and that's disappointing. If we get a hung jury, I wonder if we will get any of that digital evidence, if the devices still exist. I mean, certainly, uh, if there's stuff on the cloud, that could be retrieved, I would think. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm kind of with you. I said yesterday, even before she started testifying, I think we're going to get a hung jury on this because— I don't know. It, 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 you could really understand it from both ways, but there's just not that clear piece that tells us accurately what was going on. It may reside in that digital evidence if if it exists. Well, and, and I, to take that a step further, his digital evidence as well, mm -hmm. that should have been completely retrieved and mm -hmm. looked into because just like in the Murdoch case, you can see steps. Mm 
-hmm. just like in the Karen Reed case. You can see if that phone moves. Yeah. And that would help corroborate, did she really walk to the bedroom True. and retrieve that gun? Or, you know, what exactly happened in terms of the movement? It, again, if she had the gun and or had the phone in her pocket yeah. or in her hand during the, the event. But there's so much to be gleaned, and I feel like we just have a big dead spot in this trial. I agree. Hey, thanks for checking out the video. Be sure to follow us wherever you download podcasts, and especially Apple Podcasts, where you can get advanced episode and premium content on our premium channel right there. Also, be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss any breaking updates on the stories that matter to you most. We're on TikTok, X, Instagram, Facebook. Just search Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi, and you'll find us right there. Again, thanks for watching.